thank you for attending uh, this webcast. I can see there's quite a, there's quite a lot of you, including some uh, familiar names. Uh, hi, Cathy again. Um, Cathy, always always in on always in on the webcasts. Um, so today, we'll, uh, I want to talk about building. Uh, the reason I've set a bomb-proof backup strategy is because I want to talk through how you can make a backup for your computer that uh, for your data that is quite literally bomb-proof. Um, and will survive a, uh, a, uh, a small blast. Um, and there's all sorts of ways in which we can do this. Um, and there's all sorts of re important reasons why we need to do it as well. And um, some, of the, some of the things that you need to back up and some of the, the places where you store your information um, might not always be obvious to everyone. So I want to talk through all of these, all of these options. But first of all, who am I? Well, I'm the author of the Windows 7 Power Users Guide, which you can download free from my website at thelongclimb.com. Um, I'm the author of um, Troubleshooting Windows 7 Inside Out from Microsoft Press, and uh, several forthcoming Windows 8 books, including one from uh, two, actually, from O'Reilly here, um, which will be out later in the year. So uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP, um, awardee, and um, uh, several of you may have heard of me already. And you'll see down the bottom of each of these slides there are ways to contact me. My Facebook and my Twitter pages are down there. I also have other contacts at the end of this presentation, including an email address, and I have an open mailbox. Um, so today I'll be, after the presentation, I'll be taking, uh, taking your questions. Obviously, we'll try and prioritize the ones about backup, but I would imagine um, with the Windows 8 Consumer Preview having been released, uh, yesterday, and myself being a Windows MVP, you might have some questions about Windows 8. Um, so if you do, um, then feel free to throw those in as well. Um, I've actually got the chat room working today. So who um, did anybody download the uh, uh, the Windows 8 Consumer Preview uh, yesterday, and how do you feel about it? Please, please tell us in the chat room. So let's. Uh, look at the, de uh, the different stages in, in this presentation and what we're going to talk about. Well, the four parts I'm going to talk about are why we have, need to maintain backups in the first place, where we choose to back these up, uh, because the obvious location might not be, always be the best one, how do we back up, because there are different ways of doing it, and then I want to talk about some best practice tips, uh, because some little bite-sized best practice tips are always uh, a great way to finish off. So let's have a look at this first section here. Why do we need to maintain backups in the first place? Well, let's have a look at where we keep our files and our data these days. And it's on all sorts of places. We keep them on our desktop PCs, on our laptops, on our smartphones, on our tablets. We keep them in files in the cloud, in SkyDrive or Dropbox or Amazon S3. Uh, we keep them at home, we keep them at work, we keep them all over the place. And you'll probably find that your personal files aren't in one location, they're scattered across all manner of locations. And if you wanted to find a particular file, you might actually have to go around digging for it or wait until you get to work tomorrow in order to be able to actually get access to it. And this is a situation that occurs when you've only got one, maybe two copies of a file and you need to get access to it, this is where cloud services come in, can come in handy, but these can have their own problems. I'll, I'll talk about these in a little while. So these are the different locations in which we keep our files, but um, what type of files do we have, and why do we need to back them up? Well, here we've got my little friend Rupert, and Rupert has all manner of files. He's got uh, spreadsheets from work, he's got his his young son's homework, he's got his daughter's university coursework, that's very important. He's got his digital photographs and his, he's got his home videos, he's got his music, he's got financial information, receipts, e-books that he's bought, he's got all manner of things. And these days we store it all electronically, we store it all digitally and it's all very important to us. And we'll probably find that if we lost all of this data and all of these files, then sometimes we might not know where we are because it might be extremely difficult for us to uh, recover from 
uh, these situations, especially if you have, for instance, your insurance documents all stored electronically. It can make it very difficult to contact your insurance company. So this is why we need to back up the files, because of all the different types of things that we've got. And here, as you can see on the slides, there's just a few um, details that we've uh, things that we've got. I mean, contracts there is a very, very good one. If you enter into a, uh, perhaps a, you've got a rental agreement on your on your flat, or you have a um, uh, a higher purchase agreement on on your car, and you need to be able to know what the the terms of that are. And if you only have a digital copy, you need a backup copy of that. So let's have a look at a good location for your backups. So where do we typically back up our files to? Well, we've got several locations here that you can see on the slide. We've got a, a server or a, uh, a sort of home network attached storage device. We've got the cloud, um, things like Amazon S3, Mosey, Dropbox. Um, we've got sync in the middle where you can use services like Windows Live Mesh to automatically synchronize your files between multiple PCs. We've got an external hard drive there, and we've got good old-fashioned CDs and DVDs that you can burn your files to. Now, I want to have a look at each one of these in turn and just look at the pros and cons of each one. Let's start with networks. Now, the pros are it's very quick, it's very resilient, it's easily accessible. Um, in fact, it's the fastest backup method of all because if you have um, a network at work, then you just take it for granted really that it's there and you can access files on it and if you have network attached storage plugged into your internet router at home as I do then that is also always there and if something goes wrong with it you just have to turn it off and turn it back on again and it works on the downside your network is all in the same building so if you had a fire for instance or a bomb well, that, that we'll, we'll probably drop the bomb bit, um, then um, uh, everything's going to be lost because all of your backups are in the same location. They're all in the same physical place. So this brings us on to an external hard disk. An external hard disk, again, it's quick. It's easy to keep your backups, and uh, it can be taken off-site. You can store an external hard disk at a friend's house or at a... Um, at a family uh, member's house or, you know, store it in another safe location. I, under a bush um, un, un, or under a hedge suddenly popped into my head then, but that's probably not a very safe location. So I don't think, I, I, I'm not sure I would imagine, I, I don't think I would recommend that. But it does rely on you remembering that you need to make a backup and bringing it back and plugging it in. And, and if you're storing it um, a few miles down the road, you have to remember to go and get it on a regular basis and bring it back. And it can be a faff. It can, it, can, it, can it can be annoying. Next up, we've got CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs. Every device can read them. Uh, it doesn't matter what computer they're on. They can, they can be read with the exception of Blu-ray, um, where only a limited number of computers have actually got a Blu-ray drive. Um, they are very portable, highly portable. They're very small. You can store a large number of them in a very small space. But all discs, no matter what brand you get, are um, susceptible to degradation over a period of time. And it's inevitable that if a disc is left um, for a long period of time, then it may, you know, that it will become unreadable after, after an amount of time. And you never know how long that's going to be for that individual disc. Now, one thing you can do is you can just pop, a, um, a, pop each disc back in the drive and just read it quickly, um, which refreshes the, um, uh, an electric charge over, over the disc. And some people um, do this in order to uh, keep, the, uh, keep the disc contents fresh. But there's no real evidence that, that, this, uh, that this works, and it, and it may not help you. Um, and also, if you store these discs too close to a radiator or they're in a place where they get too cold, then that will only advance the, the degradation. So it's not really a very good way of storing, your, uh, storing reliable backups anymore. Certainly short-term backups, that's okay. 
but long-term reliable ones, I wouldn't recommend it. So what about PC Sync? This is a slightly better option, but only slightly better. <coughs> On the, the pro side, uh, all of your files are always available across all of your computers. I use Windows Live Mesh myself to synchronize all of my files across a Windows tablet, a desktop PC, and a laptop. And I know that whenever I want to go and use a file, um, it's always the most up-to-date version of that, that file on whatever computer it is. On the downside, um, the other PCs do need to be turned on in order for this syncing to work. And if you delete a file, even accidentally on one computer, that deletion will be copied onto all of your other computers. So let's say you delete a folder with your, I mean, I've, I was in France last week, so we'll say I, I accidentally deleted my photographs of, of my time in France, and uh, um, they're gone not just on one computer, but they're gone on all of them. And, uh, and then we've got the cloud. Now, cloud storage is accessible from absolutely anywhere, from any computer, um, because you're not storing it on your computer at all. You're storing it, um, you know, with Microsoft or Amazon or um, Dropbox or Google, whoever. So it's very, very accessible, but it can be expensive. Um, it can be it can be very expensive if you have a lot of um, files to um, store, especially video and things like video and music and large digital photo libraries. Also with that, um, it can take um, an extremely long time to do that initial backup, sometimes months, just to do that first backup of to get all of your files up into the cloud in the first instance because it relies on the speed of your internet connection. So overall, I would recommend that you use a combination of these different methods. Perhaps use a bit of sync, a bit of cloud storage combined with a USB drive uh, because that's a relatively inexpensive option. So that's the different places that we can store backups. Now let's have a look at how we um, can actually back things up. Now I've spoken already about things like Windows Live Mesh. So let's have a look at that first. Windows Live Mesh is free from Microsoft. It's part of the Windows Live Essential Suite. And if you downloaded the, um, the Windows 8 Consumer Preview, it's actually built in, or, or, or if you're on the repeat and Windows 8 is already out and you're wondering why I keep going on about the beta, then um, it's actually built into Windows 8. It's part of it. It's, it's part of Windows Explorer in that operating system. So you can select your, the files that you want to synchronize or back up to the cloud um, as easily as you can with something like Dropbox. And Microsoft are reportedly um, expanding the, their storage options, and they're going to offer some pricing options similar to some of the other services, unless, of course, you're watching this on the repeat again, in which case they've already done it. So that's Windows Live Mess. That's free. You can get it from download.live.com. Then there's Windows Backup. Now, this is built into uh, Windows Vista, Windows 7, um, Windows 8. Um, it's, there's a, a, an earlier version of, not quite as good a uh, version of, built into Windows XP. Now, one of the, it, it's good because it's really easy to use, and it just automatically chugs away and does backups in the, in the background automatically, provided whatever it is you're doing a backup to is physically connected to your computer. So if it's a USB attached drive, it'll only do the backups automatically if you've got that drive plugged in. However, it stores the, um, your backups as what's called a, a virtual hard disk. Um, so if you want to actually go in and pull out an individual file, it's not as simple as a, uh, a third-party solution which just does a, a backup file by file by file, which can make it much simpler to, to get files back from these backups. So these third-party solutions are many and varied. Here you can see the one that I use, NTI Shadow. I've used that for years. Um, 
it's perfectly it's actually an older version because of the newer versions like the newer versions I don't think are quite as good and um, and this just does file by file by file and you can set multiple different backup jobs so I've got my installers I've got my music I've got my files all backed up to different backed up in different ways and and the reason for this is so that the files can be backed up pretty much constantly but the music only needs to be done once a week or done once once a month and, and other things like all my software installers only need to be done as and when I tell it they need to be done. So NTI Shadow is one solution. There's uh, all sorts of other solutions that uh, are available and you may find that your antivirus package comes with backup software um, if you bought a suite from uh, Norton or another company and, uh, and it's very common for them to provide these as well. But also don't forget, trust the old pen and paper, it has literally worked for hundreds of years. So if you've got important documentation, I mentioned earlier those all important insurance documents, then obviously taking care of our forests, um, print things out, keep a paper copy so that if disaster does occur, um, you do at least have a paper copy. And of course, paper copies of things are very easy to keep out of the house securely. You could, if it's something very sensitive and very important, you could keep it at the bank perhaps. And uh, I, do, I do recommend that for all of the really, really crucial things that you can keep a paper copy for, that you do so. So, which brings me on to, because it's not... It's not a, a, a very long presentation today. The best practice tips, but it does give us plenty of time for questions afterwards. Best practice tips for backups. First of all, you want to create a backup of your copy of Windows. Now, you can do this in Windows 7 within um, Backup and Restore from the Control Panel um, or from within the Action Center. And what a system image backup is, is it's a snapshot of your copy of Windows at that particular time. With all of the software pre-installed, with all of your settings already, already done, so that if something disastrous goes wrong with Windows, then you can restore your complete copy of Windows um, nice and quickly, simply, easily, in about 15 to 20 minutes, and you're back up and running. It's uh, something that I cannot recommend highly enough. Now, it is in every version of Windows 7 and will be in every version of Windows 8. It's not in every version of Windows Vista, if you're still using that. It's only in Professional and Upwards, Professional Enterprise and Ultimate, and it's not in Windows XP at all. Um, you would need a third-party um, backup solution, uh, system image backup solution, such as Semantic Ghost, or a Cronus True Image if you're using Windows XP or if you're using Windows Vista Home Basic or Windows Vista Home Premium. Next, keep an, a local off-site backup. As I've said, it's so, it's, it's, I, I think it's the most important thing to do. Somewhere accessible where um, you can get your backup back home or back to your office if you need it. Um, but um, definitely keep it somewhere off site. Now, contrary to what you might think from this particular slide, I don't recommend sending it via donkey. But um, it, it seemed like, an, it seemed like a, a fun image to, uh, to use. So you could keep it at your parents' house, you could keep it at your kids' house, uh, you could keep it at, at a friend's, or even at, even at a neighbor's. And, uh, and then you have a backup there. And you'll probably find that you don't need to worry about too much about encrypting all your files if you're leaving it with a friend or a family member that you know that you can trust and who, frankly, has more important things to do than to go looking through all your personal photographs. So keep uh, an off-site backup. Then don't rely on cloud services. Last, not last year, about a year and a half ago, Hotmail had an outage and even I was hit by, hit by this, where they deleted loads of emails accidentally. Um, I lost 
all of my shopping receipts emails because it deleted certain folders that people have created within their Hotmail accounts. So I lost all my shopping receipts for all sorts of things that I bought from from things for my for my dog through to major electrical uh, and electronics components that I needed for you know, for the house or for work. So I, I didn't have a copy of these receipts anymore. I was relying on the fact that Hotmail would keep things in perpetuity and they would always be there and that if they had a problem then they would have everything backed up and they would restore everything for the backup. They didn't. They didn't have the backup. Um, their system automatically purged everything that was deleted 48 hours after it was first deleted, but it took um, Microsoft five days to respond to the problem, and they didn't prevent the purge. So many thousands of people lost um, hundreds of thousands of, of emails. That and the fact that you can't guarantee that the companies that we use online today, Flickr, Dropbox, Facebook, whoever, the, you know, whoever it may be, will still be operating tomorrow. So if you're storing all of your photographs on Facebook, for instance, and Facebook suddenly becomes hugely unpopular because we all decide we want to leave it, then if Facebook um, shuts down, then what's going to happen to those, all those photographs if that's the only copy? So don't rely on any one singular cloud service. In fact, if you've got digital photographs are a good example, you might want to store them up with Google and store them up with uh, Flickr or Microsoft, and you'll know then that there's multiple copies in, uh, in these locations. Speaking of multiple copies, always keep multiple copies of uh, your files and your data. Never have a single backup. I know this might sound daft, having backups of backups. I probably sound completely paranoid, um, but I am speaking from experience. Try and have uh, a copy of whatever you can up in the cloud, bearing in mind that some things like video were almost impossible to upload um, because they're so large. Try and have a, a, a local copy at home that you can restore from immediately if you need to on something like a, a USB hard disk, which are um, very cheap these days, and try and have a, an off-site, just one off-site backup that is always reliable and resilient. It's not going to be, it's not going to be as up-to-date as your, um, your one at home, and certainly won't be as up-to-date as your one that's automatically synchronized with the cloud, but in the case of a real disaster, then you know that there's something there um, that's off-site that you can use um, whenever you can get whenever you need it back. And then business backups. So if you run a business um, at your place of work, there are all sorts of additional things that you need to consider when you're having your backups. First of all, it's absolutely essential in business to have a, an off-site backup, a secure off-site backup. It doesn't really matter where it is. It could be, you know, you could store it at the, at the bank. You could store it in another office, in, in another one of your offices, which is going to be perfectly safe. But you do need to have this in order to keep your business operating and functioning because if you suddenly lose all of the project work that you're working on and all of your company databases and all your company emails and you have to begin again from scratch and you don't know what's going on, then it can completely paralyze any company, big or small, for weeks or, or even longer. The other thing to consider is encryption. And that with your own personal files, you don't necessarily need to encrypt backups. Frankly, I don't know anybody who does. But with business, it's it can be essential. If you've got um, people's personal um, data and information, for instance, such as um, the contact details and names and addresses and date of birth or purchasing information for individual members of the public, then there are data protection regulations in every country in the world that's, that you have to follow that stipulate how you must protect that data. And if you're, having, if you're storing backups, especially off-site uh, and away from the, your business premises, 
you need to make sure that those backups are encrypted all of the time. Um, just look at what happened with Sony last year when their, their own internal servers were hacked and all of this information that was stored on their servers um, wasn't encrypted at all and it was just plain text, all this information on something like 74 million of their customers. So very important to encrypt your business backups. And again, there's, there's plenty of software that you can, backup software that you can use in business that will um, do this for you um, automatically. So you don't need to worry about it. And lastly, never forget to do your backups. Here, Rupert is back, and we can see that Rupert has set himself a reminder for the third Thursday um, in the month two weeks from today to do his backup. Um, always a good idea to set, your, set yourself a reminder. If you've got a wall planner or a calendar, put a little marker on it or a little circle on it or write the word backup just to, re, just to remind you because it's actually very easy because we all, live, we all live incredibly busy lives. And backups are just, you don't, if you don't use them, then it's, it can sometimes be difficult to see the value in them. You don't see the value in these things until you really need them and then if you haven't done them and you really need them and they're suddenly not there then that's when you can have a disaster so I would always set a reminder to do a backup if it's not a system that's set completely automatically um, but even if it is a system that's set completely automatically I would check it on a regular basis once a month um, and just make sure it is actually working and it is actually backing things up. So um, that's my tips. Um, a slightly shorter webcast this week, but we've got plenty of time for questions. If uh, I see this, quite a few are coming in the, in the chat room. Next month's webcast um, might also interest you, manually removing viruses and malware from Windows. Um, that's on April the 5th. These are always on the first Thursday of the month. Then in May, building and upgrading a PC, a, a hardware webcast for, uh, uh, for you, especially in these tight times when we can't, uh, we can't afford new computers, but we want to eke a little bit more performance out of the ones that we've got. Um, or perhaps you're looking to, to buy, you know, build a new computer for uh, someone going to, uh, a child going to college um, in the autumn or in the fall. And then on Thursday, 7th of June, managing family safety in Windows 7. Now, as I say, there are plenty of ways that you can get in touch with me. Um, here are a few. My website, thelongclimb.com, uh, my Facebook group, which is always very active, uh, my Twitter handle there, and I have, as I said, an open uh, mailbag at micahmvps.org where you can email me any questions that uh, you have, and I always try and answer them. Um, I can't always promise, um, but um, I always try and answer every question that I can. So that's that presentation. Yasmina, how many, what questions do we have? All right, Mike, we have some really, really good questions. We'll start with the order that they came in. Annie says, how long do CD CDRs and DVDRs not stored too close to a radiator typically take to degrade? Well, the manufacturers, um, if you look on the packages for, uh, uh, for these things, will tell you that it will be between 1 and 10,000 years. Um, but in practice, I found that if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't read, you know, at least put a disk in your drive for 12 months, um, then it will probably... There's a you know there's a, a, a fair to middling chance that it will be dead, so I I wouldn't rely on a CD or a DVD for longer than a 12 month period um, before changing it. But as you're going to be doing regular backups, you're going to be replacing these discs on a regular basis anyway, and and they're cheap enough. Great, thank you. Okay, and our next question is from um, Reinhard. Reinhard says. PC Sync, is it a good idea if you have one TB of data, and he's referring to the cloud? I don't know if that question uh, makes sense. Hi, Reinhard. Um, I've, got, I've got several terabytes of data, and I don't synchronize all of it via PC Sync. I synchronize um, probably 
a, you know, no more than about a quarter, no more than about 300, 400, 300, 400 meg uh, gig rather. Sorry, um, it's, it can take a. The, the problem is these these huge, uh, the huge amount of time it takes to do these first backups. Um, if you've got a terabyte of data and you want to um, store it in a cloud service, one thing that you can do um, is contact each of the cloud backup providers, Mosey, Dropbox, um, and Amazon S3 and, and the other ones, and just fire off an email to their customer services and just ask them if they will allow you to post them an external hard drive with all of your backups on. Because um, there is one that told me that they could do that. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. Um, but they, they will on occasion allow you to actually send them a hard disk. They'll create that first backup for you from the contents of that hard disk, and then they'll post it back. So sometimes, rarely, they will allow you to do that. And I can only see that becoming more popular as we all end up with much more data and the, it, the cloud storage and cloud backup market becomes more competitive. Great, thank you. And Adrian um, asks, do you have any experience or opinions regarding peer-to-peer off-site backup utilities such as CrashPlan? I've, I've not heard of CrashPlan. Um, and I've, I don't have a great, a great amount of experience with, with peer-to-peer backup. Um, but generally, peer-to-peer is... Um, you know, it's an excellent idea, and it's common, very commonly used in in business. Um, it's most of you will probably have heard of peer to peer um, when it comes to things like downloading movies or or, or music legally or otherwise. Um, but peer to peer is very commonly used in in business. Um, lots of services that we use all the time run on peer to peer networks, such as Skype, for instance. Um, and it can be a highly effective method of, uh, of uh, backing up, especially in a business environment. Okay, thank you, Mike. And our next question is from Patrick. Patrick says, I have tried several backup solutions that allow me to automate the backup cycle. Where they all fa fall down is managing the space allocated for backups, automatically deleting to a cycle. Do you have any pointers? Um, the only, yeah, it is a, it is a, a, a problem with that because you uh, you have a, a hard disk or you have a um, an amount of storage on a network, for instance, where you can create your backups, and then it's surprising how quickly the amount of files and data you've got balloons and fills up all of that space, especially if you're key, if you're using um, something called versioning, uh, whereby you're keeping um, several old copies of files, um, which is commonly done if you have an automatic backup, which just you save a file and, and it goes rump and backs it up. Um, if you've made a change to that file that you didn't intend to make, then this versioning will save the previous version of that file so that you can restore from it. And if you've got this going, especially in, in a workplace where you've got um, dozens, maybe hundreds uh, of users, then um, that space can fill up very, very quickly indeed. Um, so uh, the only two solutions that I can think of off the top of my head that manage it better are Windows Home Server, um, which if you can find one, it's not, it's not hugely popular, but they are on sale. It is, it is quite good. And Windows 8 um, is introducing a new storage spaces feature, which will allow you to aggregate different hard disks in a single computer into one large storage um, space. And that's flexible. So you can add additional hard drives to that um, as and when you just get them or plug them in. Um, but that's not coming until October unless you're watching this on a repeat, in which case it's already out. Thank you so much. Okay, our next one is from Mark. Mark says, what options might you recommend to the average user to back up their Yahoo or Gmail email accounts? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, there are services that you can use online um, which will automatically back it up for you. And I can't name it off the, 
uh, top of my head. I shall do a quick just move on to the next question, and I'll um, uh, I'll see if I can find the the link for that. Okay. Let's see here. Annie says, um, a bit off topic, but can you suggest a cloud-based password manager, one that can be accessed from several laptops? Um, I there are these exist as well. This is probably something I'm going to have to um, email afterwards. So, um, Annie, if you can email me, uh, there are several, um, and I can't think of them off, off the top of my head. Um, but I will email you about that. So drop me an email at mike at mvps.org. Okay, several more questions coming in here. Let's see. Dennis says, um, do you have comments on the security of the various cloud services for backup? Uh, well, uh, security for cloud services. Um, before I answer that, let's quickly go back to the, um, the person who asked about um, uh, backing up your Yahoo or your Gmail account. Again, if you can email me, I can't find that information um, off, uh, straight off the bat here. But if you if you drop me an email at mike at mvps.org, then I'll I'll get that for you. There are certainly ways that you can do it. Um, security for the various cloud services. I would say that all the various cloud services are pretty secure. Um, I would trust them, um, well, I would just trust them, me personally. I, I, I write about security and Internet privacy quite a bit, um, and I wouldn't have any, I don't have any problems um, storing files up with, files or data up with any of them. Um, they might have, you know, enormous great big data center somewhere and you've got no idea who's going to walk in and walk out or what their actual security is like. but. Um, it's a very convenient way of um, backing up your files, and I think it's, it's definitely worth the, the minimal risk involved in using, in using cloud services. Thank you so much, Mike. We have, let's see, another question here from Michael. Michael has a two-part question, and we'll start with, um, he says, what would you recommend um, for these two backup needs? Ability right, to recover. Ability to recover when hard disk crashes and Windows settings and apps are lost. If you're using Windows 7 or Windows Vista Professional or above, then I would use the, the Windows system image backup in Backup and Restore in the control panel. Um, if you've got another, you could, because you can save your image to another hard disk in your computer or to uh, a network location, or to uh, an external um, USB or, or other hard drive, and um, and then if you need to replace the um, the hard drive, if the hard drive fails completely, then you can replace that hard drive, and your backup will still go back onto the new onto the new hard drive without a problem. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, Chuck. Chuck asks, I have a netbook oh, with Windows. Oh, he had another window. one, didn't he? Yes, wasn't, he did. Wasn't there another one? <laughs> His, that's right. The second part of that question was, how can he get a backup of a file he worked on yesterday? That's where this version, that's where versioning comes in. Um, if you change files a lot and you make a lot, of, a lot of updates to them, when you're looking for a backup solution, look for one that supports versioning or version control. Um, it's coming by default in Windows 8. Um, OS X on the Mac has had it for several years already. It's absolutely fantastic, especially when it's native in the operating system, um, but it's not native in Windows 7 or Windows Vista or Windows XP. So look for, look for backup software um, where it is, uh, where they, they have version control. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Chuck. Chuck asks, I have a netbook with a Windows starter. I've since maxed out memory to 2 gigabytes, and I'm thinking of upgrading to Windows 7. Would you recommend the Win 7 upgrade? And if so, will I lose any data by doing so after having used the NB? Um, now, when you say you've maxed out the memory, does this mean that um, your, the, the BIOS on the computer will only accept 2 gigabytes, or does this mean that you um, you don't have any spare memory slots. 
um, or does it mean that you know this is all the Windows starter wants to take? Um, if the answer is you can add more memory, then you can upgrade to the 64-bit um, version of uh, of uh, Windows, say Windows Home Premium, say, and then you can have oodles of memory as much as you can actually fit into your computer, and that's um, very cheap. Um, that's my webcast in two months' time, but you probably can't wait two months, in fairness. Um, so it is very cheap. If you are upgrading, I always recommend if you're upgrading your operating system, even if you're upgrading Windows 7 to Windows 7, please make sure that you have um, a backup separate to that copy of separate to that copy of Windows. Very important because anything can go wrong. It doesn't generally. But you never know when it will, and it's, it's probably going to go wrong when you haven't got another backup of your, of your data. Um, and also, if you want to upgrade to the 32-bit to 64-bit, Windows is probably going to make you want to make you format the drive and start again from scratch anyway, when you will definitely need a copy of that backup. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have a question from Deanna. Deanna um, says, what about using GitHub for backups on projects? I'm I've never heard of GitHub, um, to be honest. But if you email me, um, then I will. Um, I'll look into it for you. I'll. Uh, I'll. Uh, I'll get you. On, try and get you an answer. Thank you. And looks like we have a question from Dr. Dr. says, "What do you think about the Drobo NAS device?" The Drobo. The, the, generally speaking, NAS devices, network attached storage, are excellent. You plug them into your internet router. They've got one, two, three, four, five, six hard disks in them. that all uh, are aggregated storage, and you just copy your backups onto that and create folders and chuck files in and read them off anywhere on the network, and they're absolutely wonderful. The Drobo devices are extremely good, but they're really quite expensive. Um, I don't use um, Drobo devices for that very reason. There are other... And there are others that I've found. I use an Xtreme device. I've got um, a couple of Linksys, Linksys devices that are slightly older. And the Netgear ones I've had on test, I've, I've used the Netgear ones. They're excellent. They are slightly more expensive as well. But um, the Drobides are top of the line. Um, you can add, um, going back to the person who asked about adding additional backup storage, um, with some of the Drobos at least, you can just plop in extra hard drives and it will automatically add it to the the pool of storage. Absolutely wonderful, but they are very expensive. Thank you very much, Mike. And it looks like we still have just a couple of minutes here. And we have a question on Windows 8 from Kathy. Kathy says, any reason to download Windows 8 Consumer Preview if not loading on a touchscreen device? And is it viable um, to run on a netbook? Oh, I see the other question here. Is it viable to run a network, netbook with 2 gig of RAM and a 160 gig hard drive? Yes, it will. It will run perfectly well on that. I've got it running on a tablet at the moment, which has got a 64 gig um, solid state drive and 2 gig of RAM, and it runs absolutely fine, not a problem. It will it'll run on, on hardware that even Windows 7 has a little bit of trouble with. Is it worth downloading it if you haven't got a touch screen? Download it. Load it in a virtual machine. Go to virtualbox.org, um, and um, that's virtualbox.org again, and, and go and download that. It's the only one at the moment that I know of that's compatible with Windows 8. Install it in that and evaluate it. But if you haven't, if you haven't got a Windows tablet, I would probably advise, in fact, well, not probably, I would advise, don't install it as your primary OS. It might not be called a beta, but it is. It's not finished. It's, there's going to be bugs in there that we don't know about. There's going to be problems. So I wouldn't use it as your primary operating system. But there's no reason why you can't download it, put it in a virtual, install it into a virtual machine, and evaluate it and have a look at it.